I know. I didn't know this. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming here tonight to hear author William Link as he discusses his new book, Frank Porter Graham, Southern Liberal Citizen of the World. My name is Morella, and I'm the event and social media coordinator here at Planet Books. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming tonight and purchasing a copy of Will's book from us as it's a huge help as we return hosting um, in-person events. To make our events more accessible, we are recording tonight's event and it will be up on our YouTube channel soon. And to be um, mindful of our colleagues, we ask Will um, to please conclude by 7 p.m. And finally, I would like to give a very brief introduction. William A. Link is a Richard J. Milbaugh Professor of History at the University of Florida. Please give it up for Will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I wanted to make a uh, issue a few thank yous of my own. And, um, the, um, the, this book was published as part of a code series, um, the University Libraries, and uh, the, the assistance of the UNC Library was very, very significant. It's a, a magnificent library, university library, and especially the North Carolina collection. Bob Anthony um, was instrumental in making this book happen and to provide assistance in a variety of ways, so I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to talk tonight um, about some of the themes of the book and themes of, um, of Frank Graham's life. Um, and uh, in particular, talk about what it meant for him to be a liberal, what liberalism meant, um, how he helped define the term in many ways, many respects. And then finally, how, um, how uh, Graham saw the, um, the social problems of the American South as being part of the larger global pattern, things that involved uh, worldwide, um, worldwide problems, social problems, um, particularly in the area of race. So I'm going to start with a video. Uh, it's a very brief video, but it um, gives you an idea of what his voice sounds like. And it's an uh, interview with Frank Graham, um, probably in the early 1960s, followed by an interview with John Hope Franklin, a distinguished African-American historian. Okay, so I'll start with a little bit of uh, background about who Graham was and how um, he fashioned a sort of unique sort of uh, liberalism that applied to the American South. Um, this is a, a portrait of uh, Graham sometime in the 1930s with his parents. His father, to our right, uh, was Alexander Graham. Uh, his mother was Catherine Sloan Graham. Um, Alexander Graham was a fairly important uh, school reformer at the end of the 19th century. He worked in the graded school movement, helped organize schools, and um, sort of preached the, evangelized um, the, um, the message of schools and improving schools. 
uh, and then served as superintendent of schools uh, in Fayetteville, uh, where Frank Graham was born, um, and then moved on to Charlotte, where he was superintendent of the schools, Alexander Graham was, uh, for about 20 years. Both of his parents uh, came from the, the Cape Fear Valley, uh, the upper Cape Fear, that would be the area around Fayetteville and to the northwest, um, which was an area that was settled by Scots, Highland Scots for the most part, during the 18th century. So uh, Frank Graham grew up in a very distinct culture of um, uh, Highland Scot, rectitude, and also Presbyterianism. Presbyterianism is, and Christianity, for that matter, was the center of his life, although the kind of Christianity he practiced was uh, very different, probably, than practiced by most Presbyterians. Uh, Graham's uh, brother, older brother, Archie Graham, um, was a professional baseball player for one game for the New York Giants. Um, he was known as Moonlight Graham, and he appeared, or at least an actor portraying him, appeared in um, the movie Field of Dreams. Um, he played at the University of North Carolina, um, and uh, Moonlight Graham, Archie Graham, his brother, represented uh, what um, athletic achievement might mean. Uh, and Graham, Frank Graham always wanted to be an athlete, but never quite had the aptitude or talent, perhaps, to do so. Um, another important figure in his life is this guy, Edward Kidder Graham, uh, who was Frank Graham's first cousin. Um, Edward Kidder Graham was uh, president at the University of North Carolina um, for from 1914 to 1918. And um, Edward Graham uh, is considered one of a series of presidents that uh, led the University of North Carolina and refashioned it into a, um, a different sort of institution. Uh, he, he, his career at the University of North Carolina was, was cut short. He served president, as president for only four years because he died as, uh, during the great flu pandemic of 1918, as did a number of other people, of course. Um, this is an image of uh, the University of North Carolina about the time that Frank Graham arrived on campus, which was, on, uh, it was during the fall of 1905. And you can see this is the front part of the present north side of the campus, and the south, what's now sort of the south end of the UNC campus is, is dense forests or open fields. Um, Edward Kidder Graham uh, was known for coining this phrase, uh, that is, uh, the goal of seeking to make the University of North Carolina coextensive with the boundaries of the state. And the message that Edward Graham um, conveyed was that the university needed to no longer be a gentleman's club, no longer be a place where planter sons attended, and become a vibrant institution that was part of the development of the state of North Carolina. So Edward Graham's vision is that the, the, is that the University of North Carolina uh, would, be, would serve as a kind of engine of uh, social change and economic growth. And this charge, this motto of making UNC coextensive with the boundaries of the state became a kind of slogan and a, and a goal for uh, leaders of the university for the next, uh, the next century. This is an image of uh, Frank Graham's yearbook page. His senior year would be uh, in 1909, of course. He graduated in 1909. And you can see his, his docket is fairly full. He was involved in a number of activities. Um, fairly safe to say that <clears throat> even though he was short-statured, Frank Graham was a big man on campus um, and uh, was involved in a variety of activities, was not a fraternity man, uh, but helped organize uh, university activities for non-fraternity and fraternity people and, and ways in which fraternity people can get along with non-fraternity people. Um, he was a debater, very involved in debate, um, and he was very interested in sports. Uh, one of the things that Frank Graham got into while he was an undergraduate was cheerleading. Um, and he was a known, sort of legendary almost, for his ability to whip up a crowd and to uh, increase enthusiasm for the Tar Heels. Uh, Graham was, uh, made an attempt to participate in sports. This is an image of uh, 1906, uh, that would be the spring of 1906, his freshman year. And uh, Frank Graham is right here on the left, bottom left. Um, he was not a person, as they say, who was endowed with a lot of athletic talent, um, compared at least to his brother. 
but he was avid and enthusiastic about sports, and sports are something that he was always interested in, uh, always enthusiastic about, even though uh, later on he became an advocate of reforming the system of uh, college athletics. He served as an assistant editor uh, of the, what was then known as the Tar Heel, now known as the Daily Tar Heel, um, and served briefly as editor of the Tar Heel, uh, but then gave it up because of all the different, co uh, different other activities he was involved in. Um, he was um, um, constantly organizing, constantly developing the kind of people skills that he was sort of legendary for later on in life. He had a photographic memory for names and faces. Uh, he always knew where somebody came from. He knew not only where they came from, but uh, uh, who they were related to. Um, so this is part of the style, part of the, um, the operating, the modus operandi of, of Frank Graham, this ability to connect with people and to reach out, reach out across differences in terms of uh, political views often as well. Um, one of the big events in, in Frank Graham's life was uh, in January 1909, his senior year, uh, Woodrow Wilson came to visit um, the university on the occasion of the birthday of Robert E. Lee. And he gave an address that was uh, delivered before a packed audience. Um, and uh, Graham was affected, very much affected. And the thing he, thing he took away, I think, from Wilson was Wilson's idealism, um, his belief in the centrality of education, uh, these all were things that stayed with uh, Graham, and interestingly, Graham, um, in 1912, at this point, Woodrow Wilson was president of, the of Princeton University, not yet president of the United States, not yet uh, governor of New Jersey, uh, which he became in 1910, shortly after this, um, but he was uh, a university president, uh, but when the campaign of 1912 occurred, the presidential campaign of 1912, at the Democratic National Convention in Baltimore, um, Graham attended. So he made the effort to go. Um, and I think uh, Wilson was nominated something on the 42nd or 43rd, 43rd ballot. So it was an exciting sort of an event. And then later in 1922, when Wilson, uh, after Wilson had suffered a stroke and uh, was severely disabled and gave his last public speech, which was in 1922, um, Frank Graham happened to be in Washington, and there he was again. So Wilson was a, was a person that had a, a very profound influence, I think, on, on, uh, on Frank Graham. Um, shortly after graduation, or immediately after graduation, uh, Frank Graham entered law school. He eventually received a law degree, but after a year, the law student, he was bored, and um, instead decided to teach high school. So he went to Raleigh and taught in the Raleigh High School um, building. Um, beginning in the fall of 1910, he taught for two years until 1912. He taught English. Um, interestingly, because Graham became a historian later on, he didn't have a whole lot of history as an undergraduate. Uh, really had much more um, classics and uh, English literature. Uh, a central part of, of uh, Graham's life then um, and later was the YMCA. Uh, this is the YMCA building in the uh, on campus, of course, and um, Graham was active in the YMCA and then led the YMCA um, after his graduation. Uh, this was done as a sort of semi-volunteer operation, um, but it became another sort of organizing event that Frank Graham could get involved with and involve contact with people. The interesting thing about the YMCA in those days was that it was less an athletic club as a vehicle for um, social, the social gospel. Uh, the social gospel, which is this wide-ranging movement in um, American Protestantism that sought to make the, the church into a vehicle of social reform. Um, social gospelers believe that the kingdom of God, which Jesus talks about in the gospels, could be achieved today and, and human beings could actually participate in this. John R. Mott, who was a leader in the YMCA, a leading figure in the social gospel, and he visited the UNC campus um, hosted by Frank Graham in February of 1915. So the social gospel, that is the belief that you can use Christianity to uh, improve the world, social betterment and social reform, 
is another piece that's part of what becomes Graham's uh, liberalism. Um, eventually, Graham became a historian. And when he taught at the university, and he taught several years at, um, at, at Chapel Hill, uh, he taught as a historian. Uh, he didn't have much history as an undergraduate and um, picked it up along the way. And then in 1915, beginning of 1915, he started a, um, a graduate program at Columbia University in New York City. This is an image of the annual dinner. They used to do that in those days. We don't do that anymore, I guess. Um, the annual dinner of, of the entire history department with the entire body of graduate students. You can see it's a really, really small um, activity. Uh, he completed a, uh, an MA thesis um, in um, 1916 on Karl Schurz in the liberal Republican movement. Schurz was a German immigre who uh, was involved in uh, the Union <coughs> Army and was a, a prominent Republican um, in, um, in the, the end of the Civil War. Um, Graham, like a lot of other people, was swept up in the war, uh, the coming of the Great War, uh, which began in 1914, but um, uh, involved American intervention in, in the spring of 1917. And so Graham, like a lot of other of his contemporaries, wanted to, um, to um, join. Uh, they didn't want to take him. So he tried to volunteer in the Marines several times, and I think on the third attempt, finally, they did admit him. He was considered underweight, too small, uh, scrawny little guy, and um, only through grit and determination did he become a Marine. He never served in Europe, um, and that's significant because his, his older brother Dave did, and his older brother was killed early in the um, in the uh, First World War in uh, June of 1917. Uh, but the Marine uh, experience helped to shape, certainly Graham, helped to shape his attitude and his belief in the kind of global, his growing belief in the global nature of, of, of problems, political problems and social problems as well. Uh, so after the war ended, um, Graham taught at UNC, taught history, uh, he had a master's. In those days, you could teach university courses uh, with a master's. And then um, went in search of a PhD. And he went to one of the more prominent programs in the country at the University of Chicago to work with uh, William E. Dodd, um, who was one of the leading Southern historians um, and tended to, to supervise or mentor, Dodd did, um, the uh, Southerners that wanted to graduate education. Um, Columbia is another option. Um, Graham decided instead to, to go to Chicago. Working under Dodd, Dodd was something of an iconoclast. He uh, was a person that um, just tried to dispel the lost cause, what the lost cause meant, and the kind of mythology associated with it. Um, interestingly, later on, uh, Dodd is ambassador to Germany. Um, he's also a Wilsonian, so Dodd was very close to Woodrow Wilson, supported him, and um, became acquainted with Franklin Roosevelt through the Wilsonian connection, as a matter of fact. Um, and um, so Dodd is an important figure, along with others, with the University of Chicago. He spent a year at Chicago. Uh, there's a story about his, um, his friend, Max Schweringen, who was... Um, from Mississippi and studied uh, at Chicago as well, along with Frank Graham, and uh, heard a knock on the door uh, one evening, Schwerengen did, and there was Frank Graham uh, with a suitcase in his hand. And he had um, forgotten to uh, renew his um, lease with um, his landlord, and he wanted to know if he could stay with, uh, with Mac. <laughs> Mac said, sure, and he only had a single bed. Um, but he noted uh, that Schwerin did this interesting story about how um, Graham was a, a constantly talking and constantly talking about people. Even after he turned off the light, Graham would still be talking away. <laughs> um, after Graham had kind of an uh, itinerant existence uh, at this point, there's a year in Chicago, he has a year in Washington, D.C., <coughs> he studies at the Brookings Institution, um, and then he spends a year abroad. He spent a year in London. In particular, he, he was drawn to London because of, because of the London School of Economics, the LSE. 
And the LSE was known by the 1920s as a place uh, that was full of social democratic theorists, economists, sociologists, political scientists, this guy, Max Faber, is one of the more um, distinguished members of uh, the LSE group, um, but a person who was very strongly in favor of interventions by government to um, achieve social betterment. So there are a number of things going on in Graham's mind, um, but by the 1920s, he's, um, Graham per was particularly concerned with uh, the problem of labor, the problem of, um, he was concerned with the Industrial Revolution and what the Industrial, the uneven edges of the Industrial Revolution, but he was particularly concerned about what it was doing to workers. Gastonia in 1929 had uh, experienced this famous strike um, that uh, uh, badly divided the, the community. Um, and the, the unique feature about the Gastonia strike of 1929 was that it was led by the Communist Party. So you had a kind of added ingredient, uh, ingredient that sort of made it into an explosive situation. Um, and Graham uh, sympathized with um, the strikers. He was by no means a communist supporter, but he believed that communists should be tolerated. We'll see that later on, what, what uh, that meant. But it's a big event, and it sort of um, demonstrated to Graham what um, an unregulated system of industrial growth and, and labor could, could do, that the adverse effects of this. Um, he was elected president of the University of North Carolina in the summer of 1930. Um, he uh, was inaugurated, and they do this at universities, presidents have inaugurations, was not inaugurated until November 11th, 1931. This is image of, images from the Daily Targo. And uh, interesting uh, story about his election. Um, he insisted he didn't want to be president. He made his friends all promise that they wouldn't make him president, but his friends made him president anyway. Um, and uh, the descriptions of Graham are a person who's just completely shocked by this. Um, so he wasn't something that he sought. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an office that he really, really sought um, after he was probably in a very true sense, um, fell into his lap. Uh, the other big force of the 1930s, along with problems of labor and uh, uneven aspects, dimensions of the, um, uh, the Industrial Revolution, was the Great Depression, this cataclysmic event that took place after 1929 and particularly affected the South. Um, are already a place, already a region that was very poor, dramatically po poorer than the rest of the country. Um, but it's also a place where poverty intersected with race and problems of racial oppression and racial injustice. So that's a, that's a huge factor in uh, how Graham operated. Practically speaking, it meant that the University of North Carolina suffered grievous cuts in terms of its budget support. Somewhere along the line of more than a third of their budget was cut over uh, four to five years. Uh, not, only, not only cuts, but wage cuts. Um, not many layoffs, but uh, faculty, and um, Graham included, uh, his, his salary was cut even more than any of, any, any of his faculty. I don't think you'd have to see that with presidents these days. Um, <laughs> and the Depression sort of defines and frames what... Uh, what his early presidency of the University of North Carolina is going to be. Um, in 1930, 31, Graham, when he became president, was handed um, a situation in which uh, he was going to have to consolidate three different institutions. Um, study was done by Brookings Inst Institution in uh, 1930. They recommended rationalizing the system of public senior higher education primarily NC State College, UNC and Chapel Hill, and what was then known as the North Carolina College for Women. Um, and so Graham, one of Graham's charges um, was that he had to figure out a way in which these three institutions were going to be brought together, They're very different institutions. Um, and the most controversial part of this, he, he created a kind of consolidated system where there um, was um, a great deal of autonomy in the campuses. And this was the Graham tradition, I think, the way he handled things. Um, but he faced a very tough situation um, when he came to the matter of the engineering school at, the, at UNC, Chapel Hill. Um, NC State also had a small um, engineering program. 
It was universally acknowledged that UNC's program was much better. Uh, but for political reasons, Graham uh, ruled that the, that the engineering program should be entirely shifted to NC State. Uh, so this caused a great deal of bad feeling and blowback from uh, the faculty at UNC. Um, but it was something he simply had to do um, for, I guess, what we, what we would call political reasons. Um, Graham was an interesting president. He uh, was informal. Uh, he was non-bureaucratic. He didn't have many people working for him. But he was heavily dependent on certain key individuals in his life. And one of the, one of the people most, most instrumental was this guy, uh, Robert Burton House, Bob House, um, who served as assistant to Graham's predecessor, Harry Chase, who was president of UNC before Frank Graham. Uh, Bob House served as his right-hand man. So um, very often, Graham would um, move, in, move impulsively, uh, creatively, certainly. Um, but it was left to Bob Graham to pick up the pieces and bring things back to some semblance of order. And there are numerous stories about this. Graham meeting people in Union Station in Washington in his tiring months. But um, a whole department of statistics was moved. Um, and Bob House had to sort of figure out how that was going to happen. So key figure, right-hand man. Also key in his personal life was his wife. He was married in 1931. Later in life, he was in his 40s, um, his, his uh, wife, Marion Graham, Mary Drain Graham, was a daughter of an Episcopal vicar in Edenton, and um, she managed his life on a personal level. One of the things people um, noted about Graham was that he never kept money in his pockets. He was always giving it away. Um, he gave money to, um, to students, anybody in need. Uh, there's correspondence that sort of talks about uh, people writing him and writes back people he's lent money to saying, you know, don't worry about it, you know, paying you back. Um, this became something of a problem, however, because of um, the fact that Graham didn't make much money and that his whole financial basis was very insecure. So Mar Marion kept uh, the trains running at home, but she also had to put up with him. Um, this is a person who who traveled extensively, especially later in life, by the 1940s, he's just traveling all the time. Um, and he's also a person that you wouldn't receive a lot of attention from uh, if you were a spouse. Um, he is moving around in, in, in groups, especially Graham is constantly working people, constantly connecting with people on a personal level. This is an interesting quotation made by Gerald W. Johnson, who was, <clears throat> he wrote for the Greensboro Daily News in the 20s, and then um, taught at the um, School of Journalism here at UNC, and then worked for many years uh, for the Baltimore Sun, a uh, major newspaper in the East Coast. April 1942, Johnson described Graham as the best loved and also the best hated man in North Carolina. I think there's something, some, a great deal of truth in that. Um, he, attracted, um, he attracted widespread affection, but people were often uh, willing to separate the affection from their disagreement with him, often intense disagreement with him about um, issues, political issues especially. Um, and so Frank Graham became a kind of magnet for um, controversy, a lightning rod for controversy. He, on the one hand, wasn't afraid to confront co uh, controversy. He was um, courageous in many respects and bold in many respects. But he was also a, a, a joiner. He liked to join things, and sometimes he would sign his name to things that um, maybe he shouldn't have, or they'd come back to, to, um, to uh, bite him later on. Uh, but controversy is part of how Frank Graham operated. He was, he was a person that uh, tended to not seek a middle path, but instead really sort of be forthright and courageous in how he approached issues. So all these pieces sort of come together in, in this liberalism of Frank Graham. Uh, Christian influence, um, historical certainly as well. Um, very often when we read um, Graham's speeches, he, uh, um, he, he frames it historically, frames it in terms of you know, sort of the, how, the, how this particular social problem is related to um, a historical chronology. He has a social vision, certainly, in which he, he sees industrialization and economic change as bringing adverse consequences to some extent. Um, 
a vision in which he sees the South as by far the poorest region in the United States in the 1930s and 1940s, and what he called the new industrialism. So uh, for Graham, the new industrialism would be a kind of industrial system that was that had guardrails that was going to protect um, going to protect people from the adverse effects of uh, economic change. This is a piece that appeared in 1929, in which he kind of lays out what uh, he meant by some of these ideas. And again, social mastery means for, for Graham meant uh, the ability to to uh, manage industrial economic problems and to manage um, the adverse effects of the Industrial Revolution. Graham was a student person, very student-oriented. He was constantly on campus, in public. Um, he knew people by name, he knew students by name. Um, he's a person that uh, is sort of leg legendary for his, the way he remembered people. Um, there's stories of him encountering, peop uh, encountering people in Chicago, and uh, uh, he remembered what class they were in, the student was in of his, and where they sat, which really sat. Um, quite remarkable, really. But he had this, not only this interest for interest in students, but also a um, compassion for students. Um, he started this program of um, early fundraising in, in, at UNC, which was which designed to lessen the economic burden of um, attending college for many students at the university. Um, many times he housed students, he had empty space, he put them in his garage. At one point he had six, six students living in his garage. <laughs> Hard to imagine a college president or university president doing that today. One of the cornerstones of, of Graham's approach to universities was academic freedom, um, which is a term, if you read newspapers uh, and pay attention to what's going on in higher education, it's a term of great meaning right now because it's under, it's under threat. I can tell you that from the University of Florida very clearly. Um, academic freedom he considered absolutely essential to, to university life. Um, Without freedom, there can be neither true culture nor, nor real democracy. This is from his inauguration speech in 1931, November 1931. Um, and he followed through with this. So he, he, the 1930s and 40s were a tough time, controversial time, really, in um, the history of the state, history of the university. And a number of things pop up in which Graham was tested. How willing was he really going to be to stand up uh, and be willing to take the heat? Um, this is a publication that was briefly, uh, briefly appeared here in Chapel Hill. It was published by two guys um, uh, at the university. They were sort of in and out as students, some debate about whether they really were students or not. Uh, Milton Abernathy was one of them, uh, Tony Batita was the other. Um, and uh, Abernathy and Batita were remarkably successful in attracting um, writers to this publication, literary publication, on Tempo. Uh, William Faulkner comes to, um, to Chapel Hill. Um, he's on a bender, as Faulkner often was, and uh, Abernathy uh, matches him drink for drink. Um, so um, they become a, a sort of a, a, a vehicle or a, um, a, a, a venue for um, a numerous writers. And what, among them was Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was uh, one of the better known black writers of the 20th century, a poet, probably the, by far the best poet in, uh, among African Americans in, in 20th century America, a uh, central um, participant in what was known as the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and Hughes was interested in touring the South. He was mostly going to black colleges, all black colleges, who are now known as HBCUs. Uh, but the one white institution that he went to was UNC, perhaps because of its, its reputation for being a liberal haven. And so he spoke on campus. As far as I know, this is the first time that an African-American spoke um, publicly on a, at, at, the, at the campus of the University of North Carolina. Um, but in this piece, and there's uh, some poetry he attached as well, Hughes was concerned with the issue of the Scottsboro Boys. The Scottsboro boys were uh, accused of, uh, not, there were nine African-American young men who were accused of uh, raping two white women. And what uh, um, Hughes has to say here is that um, 
you shouldn't always assume it, that it's black rape of white women. Sometimes these things are consensual. Um, and he did it in a, Hughes did, he presented this article in a fairly confrontational way and it caused a furor, as you might expect, touching a, a couple of very sensitive buttons in Southern life, buttons of race and buttons of sex. Um, and there was a, a sort of a torrent of uh, criticism that uh, Graham received as a result of it, but he stood fast, um, making it clear that he didn't agree with Hughes necessarily, but he, um, he was intent on protecting his right to speak and protecting the right of students to have him speak. And his view of academic freedom and particularly free speech on the part of students was that if things get aired out, you find error. Uh, the only way you're going to test things effectively for students, in which they learn, is to put it out there and let uh, a free marketplace of ideas sort of even out um, the process. There's Hughes and that's Tony Butita there. Um, the story is also that Butita and Abernathy <clears throat> tried to take him to um, their apartment and was evicted by their landlord because he refused to have a black person in his, um, in his apartment. A big piece of what Frank Graham did in the, um, in the 1930s had to do with the New Deal. That is, of course, this cluster of programs that Franklin D. Roosevelt sponsored um, in the 1930s. Um, and uh, early on, Graham played a fairly prominent role in, um, in the New Deal. He was involved in the writing of the Social Security Act, for example, 1935. He was probably the leading proponent of federal aid to education. This was something that didn't exist in the 1930s. Um, but it's not until about 1938 that Graham gets very heavily involved in the New Deal. The New Deal, the New, the New Deal and Roosevelt in particular began to focus on the South as a particular problem, as a place where there were particular problems that were central to the development and prosperity of the rest of the country. Roosevelt came to uh, Chapel Hill in uh, December of 1938. It was a big event, 12,000 people packed in to hear him. Um, Roosevelt, <clears throat> um, Roosevelt was not only warm, warmly welcomed, but um, strongly connected with Frank Graham, I think is safe to say. Uh, in 1938, Franklin Roosevelt um, uh, commissioned a, a, a committee, the National Emergency Council, to examine the condition of the South. And they published this report. It's fairly dry, really. But the big conclusion of uh, the report, which is some words that came from Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt declared that the South was the nation's number one economic problem. The nation's number one econo economic problem. And so on the heels of this report, the report on the economic conditions of the South, um, in the fall, summer and fall of 1938, a new organization came into existence, um, the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. Um, and it's a remarkable organization. Um, it contained um, a diverse um, leadership. Uh, it had a, a significant number, probably about a third of its membership was black. Um, it, it included communists, a few communists, five or six at the most. Um, and uh, the Southern Conference became the main mouthpiece for uh, reform in the South and the New Deal in the South, the later New Deal in the South. They met in Birmingham, Alabama in, in November of 1938. And uh, there, um, one of the issues that appeared almost immediately at, at, in Birmingham the Southern Conference meeting there was, what do you do about the black members and the white members? Can they sit together? Um, and of course, Birmingham is a citadel of segregation, and um, the local police chief, um, Bull Connor, the same Bull Connor of later fame, um, insisted that the, uh, that the meeting be uh, segregated. And so what they did was, rather than put African Americans in the rear, which would have been the practice previously of the balcony, uh, they sat side by side, divided by an aisle. And Eleanor Roosevelt, who spoke, who was one of the leading speakers at the meeting, sat in the middle of the aisle. She pulled up a chair and sat there, sort of a statement about the ridiculousness of segregation. 
the Southern Conference included white liberals as well. These two very interesting individuals. Uh, Clifford Durr on the right um, was an Alabamian uh, lawyer who worked in the New Deal for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, RFC. And particularly his wife, Virginia Foster Durr, uh, came from a prominent, very prominent um, Alabama family in Montgomery. Um, and she was an organizer, really, of um, what might be called the left, the southern left, that begins to emerge here at the, um, the late 1930s. Here's an image of uh, Eleanor at the meeting uh, with Mary McLeod Bethune, who participated. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, of course, was one of the better known black women in the 20th century, a leader in the Black Women's Club movement. Um, and one of the things that sort of appears all the way through, but especially by the late 1930s, is the question of race. How can someone like Graham, who's a liberal and believes in um, social betterment, social justice, uh, live with a system that's segregated? Um, no blacks could attend the University of North Carolina. No blacks could attend the, uh, white institutions. Um, this was uh, uh, not only contrary to North Carolina law, but contrary to the Constitution of North Carolina. And Graham developed a philosophy known as gradualism, which enabled him to um, remain as an advocate of racial justice, but at the same time abide by um, uh, the rules of the road. One of the most interesting moments in uh, the discussion of Graham's um, experience in, in dealing with gradualism, the contradictions of gradualism, was a remarkable exchange that he had with Pauli Murray, who's become a person lots of people have heard of now. Uh, only a few years ago, nobody had heard of Pauli, Pauli Murray. She was an uh, extraordinary woman. Um, she had various careers as, a, as an attorney, as a civil rights activist, a later transgender activist. She was uh, the first black female to be um, uh, a vicar in uh, the Episcopal Church. Um, and she demanded to know well, first of all, she applied to UNC and was denied admission on the basis of her race. And she demanded to know, she wrote to the president of the University of North Carolina, Graham, and wanted to know why she hadn't been admitted. Uh, this is the first letter that arrived. There are three or four that, that cross. Um, and um, she's basically asking for an explanation of why, how can you justify this policy of excluding people on the basis of race? Uh, Graham responded several times, but this letter of February 3rd is interesting, February 3rd, 1939, uh, in which Graham lays out his support of equalization, which is how uh, white institutions responded to um, the possibility of desegregation, uh, by equalizing black and white institutions, um, which was ludicrous, because having a, a law school at um, North Carolina College for Negroes, later North Carolina Central, of uh, two or three white UNC faculty members isn't really gonna, that doesn't make a legitimate law school. This may seem to you to be an inadequate and minimum program, he wrote Murray, but it's going to take the cooperation and the struggle of us all to bring it to pass. The present alternative is a throwback against whose consequences we must unceasingly be on guard in the best interest of both races, who after all go up or go down together. So what he's warning is if, if um, if we go too far, there's going to be um, a, a sharp backlash. Uh, he's fearful about what this is going to mean and what it might do in terms of racial progress. I am under very bitter, bitter attack in the same letter. In some parts of North Carolina, for what little I have tried to do, I'm also subject to attack because I understand the limitations un, under which we must work. So. Um, the exchange with, with Graham, with, between Graham and, and uh, Murray is interesting because it's two different, opposite, in many ways, very different points of view about what racial justice meant. But both of them came out of this exchange pretty good friends. In fact, they saw each other as allies. That's interesting. We have correspondence from Murray later on that indicates the sort of warm relations that existed between Graham and Murray. Um, Graham had similar relationships with other civil rights leaders. For example, the NAACP <coughs> invited him to serve on their board, which you can imagine how well that would go over in North Carolina. Um, he sort of diplomatically declined, but um, he has this sort of uh, back-channel communications with 
um, civil rights leader leaders, and he enjoys their confidence. There's, a, I think, a, um, a, a common belief that, that Graham is a person, a white person who's trying to do things, and he's a person that has, has access to uh, the power structure. So during the war, a lot of things happened. Um, the New Deal, of course, is important, but even more important in many respects with World War II. American involvement in the war, the uh, mobilization of 16 million men and women under arms during the war, by far the lo largest mobilization in American history. One of the things they were very concerned about was um, rising conflict between workers and management, uh, which hurt the war effort because it stopped production. So the National War Labor Board, which um, Roosevelt created and then was created by law, uh, adjudicated numerous cases of labor conflict, um, over 20,000 of them, in fact. Um, and so uh, Frank Graham had a full full time job basically in in Washington. He lived in uh, lived in the Hotel Washington actually. Peggy, that's where he used to work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, would commute to Chapel Hill. So he would work um, Monday through Friday in uh, in Washington. Hop a train. Uh, these trains were packed during the war, of course. It's said that often he, he stood the whole way from Washington to Durham. Um, and uh, then would do his business at Chapel Hill between Friday and Sunday. So he, you know, he would have the Sunday open houses even while he was, you know, on this kind of schedule. Um, it's not a recipe for a lot of uh, rest and <laughs> recuperation, to say the least. But it, um, it's enormously important in, in sort of Graham's old career. Uh, one of the more important and interesting decisions that the NW, NWLB reaches has to do with um, salaries that were paid for black and white oil workers in Texas. Um, there, was a, there was a racial differential that operated during the war. The National War Labor Board considered the case, and Graham wrote the opinion that eliminated all racial distinctions based on race in terms of in, uh, wages. Of course, there's a host of other things that are not eliminated as well, but this is a sort of important milestone in, in uh, the history of federal uh, inter intervention in... Uh... We're running out of time? Okay. <laughs> um, I'll move through this quickly because I want to see if there are questions out there. So Graham, in the latter part of his career, becomes involved in um, navigating the treacherous waters of civil rights. He served on Harry Truman's famous committee in 1947. Um, Truman set up this, this committee to deal with the question of, of uh, racial justice, to secure this rights, these rights, which was the report of the committee, advocated wholesale federal intervention in, um, in um, rectifying racial injustice. Um, so this is important because it, uh, Graham, in many ways, tried to put the brakes on this, but at the same time, uh, he becomes known as one of the leading advocates of a new approach to, um, to race, particularly federal intervention in race. This is an image taken in March 1949 when Graham was um, leaving. Uh, in March of 1949, he was appointed senator, United you know, States senator, and these were his, this is the scene of his last remarks that he gave to the student body at uh, UNC. After becoming senator, the, the story is one in which backlash overcomes Graham, um, particularly on issues of race and anti-communism. Uh, one of his leading critics was this guy, David Clark, who edited uh, the Southern Textile Bulletin. Um, Clark was uh, a, a vigorous anti-communist and also a vigorous segregationist, and he brought those two things together. Uh, the FBI inter, um, investigated the Southern Conference for Human Welfare and concluded that there were communists there, and therefore there was communist infiltration. And again, Graham is sort of, there's a guilt by association that came to Frank Graham. Long story short, Graham, um, in 1950, was challenged in the primary election in 1950. There were two primaries, in, uh, the first in May of 1950, the second um, in June of 1950. And... Um, <clears throat> Graham um, won the first primary, but didn't have a majority. That's required by law back in those days in runoffs. And his opponent, Will Smith, called for a runoff, and Will Smith narrowly won. 
the second, uh, the second primary. But prominent in these, um, in the campaign, was the issue of race. And this is a broadside that appeared, sort of one of the more notorious, notorious ones, which explicitly connected defense of segregation with Graham's liberalism. So not only was Graham being attacked on race, in other respects he was being attacked uh, for um, loyalty, for um, anti-communism as well. Um, so the last part, if I had more time, I'd talk about it. Maybe I can get to it if we have time for questions. Um, involves his international activities. Increasingly, during World War II especially, Graham began to see the problem of social justice as an international problem, particularly problems of race. Um, that uh, anti-colonialism um, was equivalent to racial oppress oppression at home. Um, he was an internationalist. This is a speech he gave at Harvard in June of 1946, in which he talks about what the war has done and how the war has sort of had shined, shown a, a bright light on the social problems of the United States in comparison with the rest of the country. And he became involved in two important negotiations. The first, Indonesia, which was then a Dutch colony, and Graham um, sort of brokered um, what eventually became Indonesian independence, and a less successful uh, effort having to do with Kashmir, the border region between India and Pakistan, uh, and the, the racial enmity that existed between, racial and ethnic em, em, um, enmity that existed between Indians and Pakistanis. He worked for the United Nations in this capacity, in both capacities, but after 1951 became a sort of semi-permanent representative of the UN. Kashmir was insoluble, uh, and by the late 1950s, he doesn't do anything more with Kashmir, but he becomes a goodwill ambassador for the UN and becomes an advocate of the UN, UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which gives him the sort of in, in in terms of racial justice at home. This should apply to the United States as well as the rest of the world. So the latter part of his life had to do with international um, affairs, but it also had to do with the unfolding disintegration of the Jim Crow system. So, 1955, he published a widely read article uh, arguing that the South should um, enforce the Brown decision of 1954. Uh, he was a great supporter of Martin Luther King here in 1957. This is after <clears throat> this is after the uh, Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, praises him particularly for his Christian nonviolence. So Graham, Graham saw um, this as important. It was an important element in. Um, his own vision of how uh, racial problems could be solved. The sit-ins, sit-in movement of 1960, which began in Greensboro, of course, not too far from here, um, Frank Graham supported the students, again, because of their nonviolent approach and because of the whole philosophy of uh, nonviolence. So their legacies, um, this is an image of Graham uh, not too long before he died. Uh, there's an interesting sort of obituary that appeared, written by Jonathan Daniels of the Daniels family, the Raleigh News and Observer, describes him this way. He was a little giant with a tremendous heart. He was an educator firmly fixed in his devotion to the freedom of the human mind. He never grew too old to keep his confidence in young men and women and ideas. He was the gentlest of humans, yet he could be the tough in the fights to which his convictions led him. Above all, he could be fair even with those who were not always fair with him. And that would be a pretty explicit reference to 1950 and what happened, the skewering that Graham experienced. Gone longer than I wanted to. I wanted to sort of allow time for questions, but do we have time for five minutes? Okay. <laughs> so how many years was he president of the university? 19. And from so, what year to what year? Uh, 1930 to 1949. So he, you know, he was elected president in uh, summer of 1949, then 19. Uh, excuse me, 1930, and then 1940, March of 1949 became a senator. Become a senator. That's correct, yeah. Yes? Um, we, he has just a really brilliant reputation in North Carolina. Um, does he have a national, I mean, these days, does he have, do people know who he is, or, or is he strictly sort of very famous in North Carolina? Um, that's a good question. I don't know how, I mean, certainly, Anybody under the age of 50 doesn't necessarily know who he was, um, even in North Carolina. 
Um, yeah, but certainly at his, during his, his day, he was well known. Um, well, internationally. Interna oh, yeah, internationally. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, Time Magazine? Time Magazine, yeah. He had, uh, but he had national exposure. Um, yeah. And, um, but today, I don't know if, he do, if, if people would know who he was. I mean, often people would say, oh, that's Billy Graham's son, right? No, no, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Wrong Graham. <laughs> so, yes, Mary. If you were casting a feature film, a biopic about him, which actor would you pick? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He'd have to be yeah. short. Yeah, they'd have to be. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe Tom. <laughs> Somebody with a lot of term determination, but also kindness. Um, I, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, Kevin Costner. Uh, too tall. He's too tall. He's Harvey Keitel. So I don't know. Maybe Keitel's too. Yeah. So Sean Penn played. Yeah. Uh, Sean Penn. Yeah, yeah, there you yeah go. Sean so, Penn. I think you can be. Good. You can be in charge of casting when we get there. <laughs> so when he was busy with the labor board. Um, was House pretty much running the university? Yeah. I mean, was pretty I mean much. we didn't you know we didn't have texting and communication <laughs> no. back and forth. So right. They had telephones, which he telephones. used avidly. But um, but he was so busy with what he was doing. Right. I mean, so a lot was picked up by Bob House. There, there's a famous case in 19. Um, actually, it was earlier, early 1949, in which. Um, the uh, editor of the Daily Worker, the communist paper, was invited to speak at UNC, and House banned him. He banned him. Um, and when he first con House contacted Graham, said, "Well, why don't we just let him speak?" And then uh, House kind of panicked and and uh, banned him anyway. So um, mm. that became sort of an, I think, an important exception to Graham's um, free speech record, mm. even though he didn't really make it. It was really more House that made the decision. So yeah, all the little pieces were picked up by Bob House, and he ran, he ran the place. Did, yeah. you, did he resent that? That no, you know, he loved it. He loved it. Okay. Yeah, it was. No, I mean the specific instance. Of, Not that, yeah. but just in general, being. I mean, you know, that was he with him for nineteen years. Yeah, yeah, he was. Now later on, he uh, William Carmichael, Billy Carmichael, joins his team in nineteen forty-two, and. Uh, <clears throat> Carmichael is also in the inner circle. Carmichael is more conservative and he's seen as a kind of check on Graham's liberalism. Um, but he's another person that sort of made things happen um, when, you know, pick up the pieces again after Graham left the scene. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think he could have done anything differently in the, to win the 1950 election? Well, that's a good question. Well, you know, he didn't run a very good campaign. That's the honest truth. He wasn't a very good candidate. Um, he, um, he didn't um, like to attack people. He was being attacked right and left, but he's too nice. He refused to allow his campaign to um, to attack Willis Smith. Um, but they, they played dirty pool. They played very dirty. I mean, they're not only the broadside I showed you, but there supposedly was an image of, a doctored image of uh, Marion Graham dancing with a black soldier that was superimposed. Uh, that's probably the most notorious. And these are. We don't, they didn't survive. The picture didn't survive, but people saw it and reported on it. Um, so I don't know. I think he. The other problem was money. Um, North Carolina then North Carolina state law required that um, that uh, campaigns could raise no more than twelve thousand dollars. Now that even for nineteen fifty, that's a ridiculously small amount. And so people pr produce money through back channels. I mean, they appear with bags of cash, basically. Graham caught a wind of that. He wasn't going to have anything to do with that. Um, but there are instances where he, his people put out anti-Willis Smith um, literature, and he told them to get rid of it because he thought it wasn't true mm. or it was distorted the truth. So in that sense, he wasn't a very good candidate, especially in an environment where the attack politics are taking place because most of the wisdom about how you deal with attacks is to respond almost immediately. He doesn't do that. Mm. But he still won a plurality of the votes, you know, in, in the first primary. Um, yeah, well. We associate with him with Chapel Hill. Were there other places in North Carolina, like maybe Montreat or the coast or whatever, that had a special affinity for him? Well, Charlotte, I'd say, because he grew up in Charlotte. I mean, he, his parents lived in Charlotte for a long time. And um, um, certainly Charlotte, not much connection with Fayetteville. Um, 
but all over the state, he was he was a person who always worked all the different angles. So he he, uh, he knew everybody in the state. He knew everybody in the state. He had a state network. Didn't drive, as you probably know, uh, but he had a driver, um, and he just you know piled in the car and he driven. There's a story about him. Uh, uh, Bob House would often fill in for him, and uh, um, House he called House and said, "I can't make this meeting." And uh, House got halfway to Goldsboro, and uh, Graham. Um, Graham said, I'm there already, so you can go back. And uh, <laughs> that wasn't entirely a, unusual. Out of time? All right, good. Well, thank you very much.